right? Um, yeah, another Lemino. This has been requested a lot. A lot of people have said do this one. The enduring mystery of Jack the Ripper. And I love that you constantly, in England, my whole life, every 10 years or so, they do a documentary on who's the real Jack the Ripper. And it's always the same fucking shit. But Lemino, or Lemino, but Lemino, he, um, I trust his research. Like everything I've watched from him, you're like, and he puts it in a way that's just so easy to follow. And you're like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I can actually, like, I trust that he's put the time in to research it, basically. So, yeah, let's go. Just let me know. Let me know. Events documented in this video may disturb some viewers. No graphic imagery will be shown. Oh. To be fair, did they even have pictures back then? Jack the Ripper. In the late 19th century, the city of London was the largest in the world. A sprawling metropolis and a melting pot for trade, finance and people. But in the autumn of 1888, an horrific story emerged from the capital's east end. A story so dreadful it sent shockwaves around the world. One after another, destitute women of the East End fell victim to a vicious killer known as Jack the Ripper. Despite an extensive manhunt and a few close calls, the Ripper was never caught. Instead, the murders came to an abrupt end and left behind one of the greatest mysteries in the annals of crime. True, still to this day, Jack the Ripper is... In the East End of London, there's a district known as Whitechapel. In the late 19th century, Whitechapel was known for its overcrowded slums, where many of the capital's poor and unemployed had taken refuge. Day and night, an army of policemen would constantly patrol this labyrinthine network of dim-lit streets, courts and alleys. One such place was a narrow passage known as George Yard. Near the north entrance of this passage was a residential complex known as George Yard Buildings. It was the morning of August the 7th, 1888, when an upstairs tenant named John Reeves headed out for work. Upon reaching the first floor landing, Reeves encountered the body of a woman lying upon her back in a pool of blood. Horrified by the sight, he stumbled down to the street below in search for help. Constable Thomas Barrett was the first officer on the scene. He was soon joined by Dr. Timothy Killeen, who conducted a brief examination. See what I mean with the the woman had been stabbed times. 39 times, primarily in the chest Fuck. and abdomen. Dr. Killeen estimated that she had been dead for, quote, about three hours, thus placing the time of death at approximately 2.30 in the morning. The woman had likely been attacked where she was found, as no blood was found beyond the staircase landing. But this was strange, as none of the tenants in this crowded building had heard a single cry for help or a disturbance of any kind. One exception was Amy Hewitt, a tenant who claimed to have heard a lone cry of murder. But this was early in the evening of August the 6th, and the scream had emanated from outside the complex. Hewitt further explained, The district round here is rather rough and cries of murder are a frequent, if not nightly, occurrence. The victim was eventually identified as 39-year-old Martha Tabram. Tabram was a mother of two and had separated from her husband many years prior. Her last known address was 19 George Street, a common lodging house less than 300 meters from the site of her death. Tabram had made a living through prostitution, and one of her associates was a woman named Marianne Connolly, Connolly testified that on the evening of August the 6th, she and Tabram had been out drinking with two soldiers. Then, shortly before midnight, the party of four had separated. Connolly took her client into Angel Alley, while Tabram guided hers into neighboring George Yard. 
it was the last time she saw Tabram alive. Barely two hours later, Constable Barrett had spoken to a soldier loitering near the north entrance of George Yard. The soldier had told Barrett that he was, quote, waiting for his mate who had gone away with a girl. Half an hour later, Tabram is presumed to have died. Both Connolly and Barrett were called upon to identify the soldiers, but all those accused could provide an alibi. One had been at home with his wife, another at an army base, and yet another in a completely different part of the city. This was enough for Inspector Edmund Reed, the lead investigator on the case, to abandon this line of inquiry. Connolly and Barrett, having both picked out the wrong men, they could not be trusted again as their evidence would be worthless. Even if a soldier had been responsible, no one could deduce a motive. The people of Whitechapel might have been accustomed to crime and violence, but the sheer brutality of this attack was as frightening as it was confounding. The crime is one of the most brutal that have occurred for some years. For a poor defenseless woman to be outraged and stabbed in such a manner is almost beyond belief. These were the concluding remarks delivered at the final inquest held on August the 23rd. Only a week later, things would go from bad to worse. <clears throat> on the morning of August the 31st, a man named Robert Paul left his home on Foster Street and headed for work. After making a right turn into Bucks Row, he spotted a man standing in the road. The man turned around to face him and said, Come and look over here. There's a woman lying at the pavement. The stranger was named Charles Cross, and he too had been on his way to work when he first caught sight of the woman. The two men now cautiously approached. The woman's hands were cold to the touch, and Cross believed she was dead. Paul, however, thought he could sense faint breathing, but instead of seeking immediate help, Cross and Paul were more concerned about being late for work. As such, they quickly resumed their morning commute, hoping to notify policemen along the way. Jesus. Fortunately, Constable John Neal was just around the corner. Neal was equipped with a lantern and found the woman lying on her back with a deep cut across the throat. The wound was still bleeding and parts of her body were still bleeding. He was soon joined by Constable John Thane, who was sent at once to fetch a nearby doctor. Upon his arrival, shortly after 4 o'clock, Dr. Rhys Llewellyn estimated that, quote, She had not been dead more than half an hour. In other words, Cross and Paul had likely found the woman mere minutes after she was killed. Jesus. Furthermore, three officers had patrolled the vicinity just a few minutes prior. Constable Neal had last inspected Box Row at approximately 3.15. So too had Sergeant Henry Kirby, whereas Constable Thane had merely passed the end of the street, none of whom had seen nor heard anything amiss. Upon the body's removal to the mortuary, a shocking discovery was made. Apart from two incisions in the throat, the woman had also been, quote, disemboweled. No organs had been removed, but Dr. Llewellyn found, quote, several incisions running across the abdomen. He also believed that the killer possessed, quote, some rough anatomical knowledge, for he seemed to have attacked all the vital parts. The victim was quickly identified. Her name was Marianne Nichols, and she had turned 43 just five days.
Tabram had been repeatedly stabbed, whereas Nichols had suffered multiple <laughs> This is just kind of great because it's yeah you're seeing like it's all old London and it's really not really changed that much to be honest but anyway let's go As the sun was rising on September the 8th, a man named John Richardson was on his way to work. At a quarter to five, he made a quick stop at 29 Hanbury Street. He went through the entrance and out the back door by way of a cramped hallway. Richardson then sat down on the backyard steps before grabbing a knife to trim a vexing piece of leather from his boot. Once satisfied, he left the building and shut the front door behind him. About an hour later, a third floor tenant of the same address, John Davis, plodded downstairs and into the hallway. The front door was now wide open, but the one in the back was closed. When Davis went to open it, he found the bloodied remains of a woman lying on her back just below the steps. Inspector Joseph Chandler was the first officer on the scene. After a brief inspection, he sent at once for a medic. Dr. George Phillips arrived at half past six and found the woman, quote, terribly mutilated. The throat had been, quote, dissevered deeply, whereas the abdomen had been, quote, entirely laid open. The intestines had been, quote, lifted out of the body and placed by the shoulder of the corpse. The body was then conveyed to the mortuary, while Inspector Chandler and Dr. Phillips conducted a sweep of the backyard. Most of what they found belonged to the tenants of the building, but just below the resting place of the woman's feet, they found a small piece of cloth and two combs. The items had likely belonged to the victim, but it seemed to Dr. Phillips that they had been deliberately positioned and arranged by the killer. The post-mortem revealed that two brass rings had been forcefully removed from the victim's left hand. These rings were nowhere to be found. Portions of the victim's abdomen had also gone missing, including the womb. Dr. Phillips believed that, quote, the mode in which these portions were extracted showed some anatomical knowledge. This point was greatly expanded upon at a subsequent inquest. The injuries had been made by someone who had considerable anatomical skill and knowledge. There were no meaningless cuts. For instance, no mere slaughterer of animals could have carried out these operations. It must have been someone accustomed to the post-mortem room. The victim was quickly identified as Annie Chapman. Chapman's date of birth is a bit uncertain, but she was roughly 47 at the time of her death. She had at least seven children, but was tragically only survived by two. Her last known address was a common lodging house at 35 Dorset Street. On the night of her death, Chapman had been denied accommodations as she lacked the funds to pay for a bed. She was escorted off the premises by the night watchman, who then saw her vanish into a nearby alleyway. What happened to Chapman over the next few hours, nobody knows. Her whereabouts during this time is a complete mystery. But unlike the two previous cases, a witness in the Chapman case might have caught a glimpse of the killer. At half past five on the morning of September the 8th, a woman named Elizabeth Long spotted a man and a woman conversing outside 29 Hanbury Street. Long was positive that the woman she'd seen was Annie Chapman, but the man had stood with his back towards Long, so she never saw his face. Long did, however, manage to overhear a fragment of their conversation. The man had posed the question, Will you? To which the woman responded, Yes. Now, a lasting point of contention in the Chapman case is the time of death. 
According to Dr. Phillips, when he arrived at 6.30, Chapman had been dead for, quote, at least two hours. That would place her death at around half past four. But according to Long, she saw Chapman alive a full hour later. Then there's the testimony of John Richardson. Richardson was the son of one of the tenants in the building. At a quarter to five, he made a routine checkup on the door to the basement, which had previously suffered a break-in. When he found it secure, he sat down on the backyard steps to trim a piece of leather from his boot. Even though he sat mere centimeters from the murder site, Richardson did not see a body. He was adamant on this point. I could not have failed to notice the deceased if she had been there. To muddle the timeline even further, there's the testimony of Albert Kadosh. About 20 minutes past 5, Kadosh had gone through the backyard of 27 Hanbury Street when he heard voices coming from nearby. They were barely audible, however, and Kadosh had only made out the word, no. A few minutes later, he heard something falling against the wooden fence, dividing the two yards. There's no one way to untangle this web of contradictions, but Dr. Phillips did concede the possibility that he'd miscalculated. That, quote, the coldness of the morning and the great loss of blood had skewed his opinion, which was largely based on the warmth of the body. So, presuming that Dr. Phillips did miscalculate, and the recollections of Long and Kadash were off by a few minutes, that would place Chapman's death at around 5.30 in the morning. By this point, the dim light of dawn would have provided the tenants of 29 Hanbury Street an unobstructed view of the murder site, some of whom had even slept with their windows open. In spite of this, the killer managed to evade detection and even made time to arrange the victim's possessions. As the tally of victims gradually mounted, the public grew increasingly anxious. They were not only frightened by the murders, but frustrated with the police and their perceived incompetence. Even across the pond were the efforts of the police fiercely criticized. The London police and detective force is probably the stupidest in the world. What these mocking quotes and illustrations failed to capture were the overwhelming odds stacked in favor of the perpetrator. The police were up against someone who seemingly struck without motive, someone who left no murder weapon and few witnesses. On top of that, the East End was severely overcrowded while the police were understaffed. As one newspaper put it, a man in the East End of London is a grain of sand, as invisible and almost as much beyond identification amid the masses. At no point would this become more apparent than during the events of September the 30th. And we'll do one more chapter. <clears throat> on September the 29th, a routine Saturday meeting was held at the Socialist Club on Burner Street. When the meeting came to a close around midnight, all but a few members returned home. Those who remained proceeded to drink and socialize. Half an hour in September the 30th, Joseph Lave stepped outside to get some fresh air. Lave used the side entrance leading into Dutville's yard and lingered for about 10 minutes. Moments after Lave had gone back inside, Morris Eagle accessed the building via the same entrance. He too was a member of the club and had just returned after escorting a woman home. Neither of them noticed anything unusual. 20 minutes later, the sound of a horse and carriage could be heard trotting down Burner Street. The driver was Louis Diemschutz, the steward of the clubhouse. When Diemschutz drove into Dutville's yard, his pony abruptly veered to the left. When he looked down to his right, he thought he could discern something in the darkness. Diemschutz stepped down from his barrow and after lighting a match, could see a woman lying on her side against the wall. Without even knowing if she was, quote, drunk or dead, Diemschutz rushed inside the club to check on his wife. When he found her safe and sound, he alerted the other members, and a small crowd soon gathered outside. They could now see that the woman's throat had been, quote, fearfully cut, and that, quote, a stream of blood was trickling down the yard. Eagle, Diemschutz, and a few others promptly dispersed to find a policeman. 
While a growing crowd of bystanders waited for authorities to arrive, there was no sign of the perpetrator. But across the city, less than a kilometer to the west, an even more ghoulish discovery was about to be made. At half past one of the same morning, Constable Edward Watkins patrolled an open space known as Mitre Square. Watkins' beat would take him through the square about once every 13 Jesus. minutes, and on this occasion it was deserted. But in the time it took Watkins to complete another rotation, Mitre Square was turned into a crime scene. I next came in at 1.44. I turned to the right. I saw the body of a woman lying there on her back. I saw her throat was cut and her bowels protruding. The stomach was ripped up. She was lying in a pool of blood. Dr. George Siqueira and Dr. Frederick Brown soon converged upon the scene. They found terrible injuries inflicted upon the woman's face, throat and abdomen. The intestines had been, quote, drawn out to a large extent and placed over the right shoulder. Among the many lacerations to the face, Dr. Brown noted that, quote, the lobe and oracle of the right ear was cut obliquely through. Based on their expert opinions, coupled with the testimony of Watkins, the woman had died within minutes of her body being found. Jesus. Back in Burner Street, Dr. Frederick Blackwell and Dr. George Phillips had reached the same conclusion. The woman in Dutville's yard had died within minutes of her body being found. But unlike previous victims, she had only suffered injuries to the throat. There were no abdominal mutilations or anything else by which to connect the attack to the others. But the murder in Dutville's yard and the one in Mitre Square were separated by less than one kilometer and some 45 minutes. This allowed for a chilling possibility. It was suspected then, as it continues to be today, that when Deemschutz came clattering through the gateway, he unwittingly interrupted the murder. The killer may even have become trapped inside Dutville's yard because the gate on Burner Street was the only point of entry. Perhaps they saw an opportunity to escape when Deemschutz then rushed inside the club. From there, it would have taken them less than 15 minutes to reach Mitre Square. Plenty of time to hunt for another victim. Yeah, but it must be emphasized that this is pure speculation. There is no evidence to suggest the two murders were even connected. No, I'd say so. The woman in Dutville's yard was identified as 44-year-old Elizabeth Stride. Stride was a Swedish immigrant who'd lived in London for over two decades. Following the death of her husband, she had made a living through prostitution. Her last known address was a common lodging house at 32 Flower and Dean Street. On the night of her death, Stride had been seen by quite an abundance of witnesses. First, she was seen in the company of a quote, respectably dressed man around 11 o'clock. About a quarter to midnight, Stride was seen talking to a man who was quote, decently dressed and had the appearance of a clerk. Then, only a few minutes before the murder, Stride was seen in the company of a man by Constable William Smith. The man was carrying a small parcel wrapped in newspaper and was of quote, respectable appearance. It's unclear whether these descriptions are of the same person or if Stride accosted multiple clients as the night progressed. There were other witnesses, some less credible than others, but the one that really stood out from the rest was Israel Schwartz. About a quarter to one, Schwartz had been walking down Burner Street. As he came up on Dutville's yard, he witnessed a man throwing a woman to the ground in front of the entrance. The woman had, quote, screamed three times, but not very loudly. Schwartz would later identify this woman as Elizabeth Stride. Schwartz did not try to intervene, but opted instead to simply cross the street. That's when he spied a second man on the opposite side who was lighting a pipe. The man who attacked the woman then appeared to address the second man by shouting the name Lipsky. The pipe smoker then proceeded to follow Schwartz before eventually breaking away. When taken at face value, 
this story appears to suggest that the killer had an accomplice, an accomplice by the name of Lipsky. This was indeed the interpretation of some government officials. But Inspector Frederick Abeline, one of the lead investigators on the case, had a very different interpretation. You see, the name Lipsky had gained notoriety in 1887 when a Jewish man by the name of Israel Lipsky was convicted of murder. Owing to the publicity of that case, the surname Lipsky had become an anti-Semitic slur. Abeline therefore deduced that the man who shouted Lipsky was directing an insult at Schwartz, who was described as having a quote, strong Jewish appearance. The man with a pipe meanwhile may have been an innocent passerby who became frightened along with Schwartz. Whether Abeline's interpretation is correct, it's doubtful we'll ever truly know. Nevertheless, Schwartz's account is compelling as he conceivably witnessed the moment when Elizabeth Stride was attacked. Back in Mitre Square, a large crowd of spectators had ascended upon the scene. That's so All London, by, by the way. Morbid That's so London. Like, even to this day, London is exactly like that. If you go on the tube in London, everybody's like looking up at the sky. No one wants to make eye contact with anyone in London. And you like... You would do that. If you saw some shit happening in London, you just fucking walk the other way. People are like, it's not my business. It could be anything. But that is exactly what it is. Like, people from up north say that. Because up north, they're all, like, more friendly, I suppose, or at least more open. <clears throat> and, like, you see them all say how, like, miserable everybody is in London. No one talks to anybody. And you are seen as a freak. If you just walk up and talk to somebody in London, they'll be like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, but yeah, let's go. Curiosity ...to get a glimpse of the body. The post-mortem revealed that the killer had extracted a few organs, including the womb and left kidney. According to Dr. Brown, this extraction required, quote, a good deal of knowledge, which he likened to that of a butcher. By contrast, Dr. Siqueira did not find any signs of, quote, great anatomical skill. The woman in Mitre Square was identified as 46-year-old Catherine Eddowes. Eddowes had at least five children, but after escaping her abusive husband, she had become estranged from her family. Her last known address was a common lodging house at 55 Flower and Dean Street. On the night of her death, Eddowes had been out drinking. She got so drunk that around half past eight, she was found lying on the sidewalk in Aldgate High Street, surrounded by a crowd. The commotion attracted a few officers, who then escorted Eddowes to a nearby police station. There, she remained locked in a cell until one o'clock in the morning. After being released from jail, Eddowes was likely spotted in the company of a man in the vicinity of Mitre Square, Only one of the three witnesses, Joseph Lavenda, had paid close attention to the couple. The man had the appearance of a sailor and wore a, quote, reddish handkerchief round his neck. While Lavenda did identify the woman as Catherine Eddowes, he never saw her face. Nevertheless, this sighting was only made some ten minutes before Eddowes' body was discovered by Constable Watkins. What's so incredibly tragic about the Eddowes case is how narrowly the killer escaped justice. First of all, the only private rest- I suppose as well, because in London there's really nowhere to hide. So prostitutes would be the perfect people because they would know. They would know where to take someone that is really remote and that no one's going to see. Which is pretty smart, actually. ...residence in Mitre Square was occupied by a policeman and his family. They had slept right next to an upper floor window overlooking the murder site. Shit. Second of all, a night watchman and retired policeman had been cleaning a warehouse within earshot of the murder site. He would routinely hear the footsteps of patrolling officers, yet heard nothing at the time of the murder. Finally, Constable James Harvey had glanced into Mitre Square at roughly 20 minutes to two that's right in between the sighting by Lavenda and the body's discovery. Harvey should have had an unobstructed view of the murder site, yet he failed to notice anything suspicious. 
Was it too dark? Was the killer standing just a few meters away, cloaked in shadow? Did one or more witnesses get the time wrong? While the killer did ultimately escape, they did not do so without leaving a trace. Shortly before 3 o'clock, a bloodstained piece of cloth was found near the entrance to a building a few blocks to the northeast. It proved to be a ripped portion of the apron worn by Eddowes. The patch had evidently been torn off and then discarded by the killer upon their escape. Now, on the wall above this patch of apron, someone had written a message. The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. To this day, both the meaning and the author of this message remain in doubt. Was it written by the killer? Was it an attempt to cast suspicion upon or even away from the Jewish community? Was it completely unrelated to the murder? Similar questions would soon be raised by a few letters letters which had supposedly been written and posted by the killer. I will pause it there. Chapter 5. Lemino is the best documentary maker, though. Like, just how he breaks down and how they, like, yeah. He goes into every avenue of everything. And the times, and yeah. So good. But yeah, it's funny to think of London in, back in then days. And it's really a very similar vibe, depending on where you are. I don't know whether Whitechapel, to be fair, is still a rough area, because rough areas tend to move, don't they? And it moves somewhere else. But yeah. Yeah. It's mad. It's just mad how nobody saw it. But then I suppose as well, the other thing is, is there's no CCTV. There's no real, like, forensics. There's, like, nothing, really. You need to see someone doing something or someone needs to see it. Otherwise, you should... and it seems like he's, like, having some real close calls. The other thing is as well, one thing you don't have is a police on the ground presence in London. Now... You see them driving around, but not like that. Not where they're patrolling the streets like that. <clears throat> Although, I was going to say, it's probably better doing it like that, but they didn't catch Jack the Ripper, so... And then I suppose the other thing could have been as well, because another reason why it's good to choose prostitutes is because who, who cares? I know that sounds horrible, but a 47-year-old prostitute isn't going to... It's not like a, some family, yeah, some daughter of a family, like he picked kind of older ones too. But it is, it's people that no one gives a fuck about anyway, so, yeah, he's very smart. He's mad how it's kind of all different. But yeah, anyway, that's the reaction, sweet.